Our scripture reading this morning, the, the text is verses 19 and 20 of Acts chapter 3, but I want to read the, the chapter up to that point, and then we'll focus on those last couple of verses that I read, verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 3. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Those last two verses there are our text for this morning. Verses 19 and 20, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. As you know, friends, we're in a sermon series in the book of Acts. We began last week looking at Acts chapter 1, and Last week in the bulletin and then on that green sheet that was distributed to everybody in the congregation, there's a reading schedule for each day, a chapter from the book of Acts, and then also a particular item in our church's ministry and life to pray for. And what the church renewal team wanted to, wants to see happen is that as we join together and as we as we live into God's word as we read it together, as we pray together for the life of our church, that those are the ways in which the Spirit speaks to us and, when, and works in our hearts and lives to affect change, to affect renewal. And each of, the, each of those, the days throughout these weeks of the sermon series, there is that opportunity you have to to read a passage of Scripture, a chapter of the book of Acts, with your brothers and sisters here at Grace CRC, and to reflect on that, to pray for something, and to know that it's not only you praying, but that others are praying with you, that we as a community are praying together. And we are looking at this 
chapter, in these, these couple of verses near the end of the chapter, verses 19 and 20 today, as we think about how it is that the New Testament church, the early church, was birthed by the Spirit. We read about that in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the believers who were gathered there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and we're told that the, uh, the, as the Spirit was poured out, people from all over the world, from different parts of the world, who spoke different languages, heard the gospel, heard the message of salvation in Jesus Christ in their own language. And 3,000 people came to know the Lord that day. And, that, and then, that, then that ministry goes on as we, as we enter into uh, chapter 3 here, as the story of the early New Testament church goes on. And we want to think about how it is that this, the, these stories of the early experience of the New Testament church, the birth of the church, also call us and, and show us what renewal looks like. So as we, as we look at this passage this morning in chapter 3, we want to think about how it is that this, the message of chapter 3, the, these, this encounter that Peter and John have with this lame beggar, this man who is laid at the temple gate to beg for coins so that he could buy bread for himself. We want to think how it is that this story and then what Paul, or sorry, Peter and, and John, how it is that they describe what's happened. They, they don't just perform a miracle, do they? they but they, then they go on to tell why it is that that miracle was significant. So what we might be struck by as we look at this, uh, at this story from Acts chapter 2, it is the lack of strength and power and standing of this man who sits at the temple gate begging for coins. You know, he was, he was placed there strategically. We can, we can kind of guess at that. You know, we, we can guess that probably people going in to pray, to worship God, might also have been reminded of the call that's, that's articulated throughout the Old Testament in numerous places to not only worship God, but to also care for those who are in need. So this man may have been hoping that as people went into the temple to pray, as they went in to worship God, they would also remind, be reminded of that second part of the law. Not just to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but to love your neighbor as yourself, particularly your neighbor who was in need and couldn't help themselves. So he may have been placed there strategically, but this was a man who, who had little standing in society, who had no strength. I mean, we're told that his, his legs were weak. He couldn't stand. He depended on others to, to place him at this gate every day so he could beg. He depended on the, on the kindness and generosity or maybe even the pity of others who were going in to pray. And as we think about that lack of power that, that this man had, this lack of standing, it's interesting that Peter also acknowledges that they have a, a lack of power, or at least a lack of resources. Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. I, I wonder if, for many of us, I, I've felt this at times throughout this last 10 months, that, that we have a, a feeling of powerlessness in the face of this pandemic. And, and, and we, we have this sense that there are, there are things that are so far beyond our control that, that things like restrictions and lockdowns are imposed on us. And now we can even acknowledge that, that they're for our own good, but it can be frustrating it, and it can, it can make us feel as though we're powerless in the face of so much that is, seems to be against us. We don't have any resources, it seems like sometimes, to, to 
push back against this pandemic and, and, and the restrictions that it imposes on us. But it, that, pow, that sense of powerlessness that we might feel, maybe that gives us just a, a, a little bit of a window into this man's experience. I mean, this experience we've had is 10 months. As we're told, he, was, he had been this way from birth and he was a grown man, maybe, say, 40 years old. He had been this way from birth. And, but we can maybe identify with that sense of powerlessness he had. And as Peter also identified with him, he, he recognized his humanity. He, we're told he looked right at him. He didn't you know, turn his eyes away and try and glance the other direction. He looked right at him. And he said to the man, look at me. And the man looked at him. And Peter acknowledged his own lack of resources. He said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, Peter didn't have a lot of silver and gold. But, and he didn't have resources. But the resource that he did have, the one thing he had, was the name of Jesus Christ. If you caught the midweek devotional uh, earlier in the week, I, I highlighted this, that Peter and John, the one thing they had was the name of Jesus Christ. You know, as, as our church goes forward into a, a new and unknown future, as we begin and continue this, this process of church renewal, we might feel like we don't have a lot of resources, even though we have been blessed. We've got a wonderful facility that we know will, will help enable ministry as we go forward. We have generous people here who give of their, of not just of their financial resources, but of their spiritual gifts and their time and their energy to make ministry happen here in this place. But the greatest resource we have the greatest resource we have is the same one that Peter and John had, the name of Jesus Christ. And what Peter wants to do as he, as he heals this man, or is, to be more specific, is God heals this man through him by the power of Jesus. As God heals this man through him, what we're told is that the crowd was filled with wonder and amazement there in, in verse 10. The crowd was filled with wonder and amazement. And then later, just a verse later in, in verse 11, we're told that they were astonished. The crowd couldn't believe what had happened. But what Peter wants to make sure it doesn't happen is that they don't get stuck in that place of wonder and amazement and astonishment. But that they go from exclaiming, wow, what happened here? To asking, why did it happen? Instead of saying, how could this be? To say, how should I respond? To go from wow to asking why. God healed this man through Peter. But then he says, there's a greater miracle here. The miracle of forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ. And, and he said, you know, we may have pitied this man who sat there at the gate. We, and we didn't think there was anything we could do for him to heal him. There, we didn't think there was anything to do for him but to give him a few spare coins once in a while. We, we may have seen him. And we may have felt sorry for him. But he says... We, the man deserved our care and compassion and kindness in a way. But he says, we didn't deserve the greater miracle. Peter, I mean, he makes it very clear as he, as he lays out what it is he's, he wants the, the crowd to understand. He, he says to the, the people there, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? He says, you believe in God, right? You, knew, you know that, that God created all things, that, that God brought our ancestors our, out of slavery in Egypt and that he performed miracles for them. He gave them manna to eat in the desert. And 
He says, this shouldn't surprise you. God is a God who does miracles, who brings new life and healing where it's needed. He says, this shouldn't surprise you, but the greater miracle is this. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son, Jesus. And then you handed him over to be killed, he said. You disowned him before Pilate. You asked that a murderer be set free instead. You killed the author of life. I mean, you, you hear the, the tone in Peter's voice, maybe. He's saying, you are not really to be to an object of kindness uh, or to be thought of as an object, a, a person who's, who, who should receive kindness or care. And in fact, you deserve quite the opposite because of what you did. But Peter says the greater, the greater miracle than the healing of this man who was lame from birth, the greater miracle is that God loved you and that God forgives your sins in spite of the fact that you killed Jesus, the one who came as a sacrifice. But yet, Peter says, God has used this to bring about your redemption. God's used this terrible tragedy to bring about your healing and to give you new, new life. So Peter says, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Folks, this is so central to what the church is and who, or who we are and what we are called to do. Not just our church, but the church from the very beginning around the world in every place. Repent and turn to God. That is the, that is the bare bones, basic foundation of the gospel. The call to repent and turn to God. And one thing that, that we need to do as a congregation is to get that straight. To remind ourselves of that. If, and if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never heard that message that Jesus died for your sins and realized that that was for you, for me, that he died for your sins. And not only that, but that he rose again to give you new life. If you've never heard that good news and said yes to that and, and know that that gift of God's grace and forgiveness is for you, that's where we begin. But you see, that's not an ending either. That, that repentance is, is something that is ongoing. It, it, the word in Greek there is metanoia, and it, it means change. It's a, it describes a process of change. In, in, in what Peter says here, repent and turn to God. It, it's kind of repetitive the way he, he phrases it here because that word metanoia is, can also, oftentimes in, in Greek, it's used in a military context. As a, uh, it's when a, a soldier is marching one way, he stops and turns around and goes the other way, makes an about face. That's metanoia, that's repentance, that's change. It's stopping one way that you were going, turning around and going another way. So Peter is saying, stop. Stop doing what you were doing, trying to live life on your own, trying to please God on your own, and instead turn toward God, receive that gift of forgiveness and new life that's yours in Jesus Christ. He wants these people to repent, to come to faith, to change, to turn around, but that's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said it's not just a one-time thing. We, we all have to come to that point in life where we say yes to Jesus, where we repent, where we, where we turn toward God and we receive that gift that God offers 
of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. But that's also an ongoing process of renewal. Each of us, whether we've said yes to God just now, today, or many, many years ago, expressed our our faith and our trust in Jesus for our salvation and forgiveness from our sins, whether that's today or many, many years ago, repentance is in some ways a daily process. It's, a, it's, it's turning each day, turning toward God in each new stage of life, saying to God, what is it that you would have me to do to be faithful, to grow in greater faithfulness to Jesus, my Savior, to follow him more closely? Repent, Peter says, Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that you may be forgiven, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That you might begin to live that new life each new day. That you might be restored. Folks, that's, that's what we want to do through this church renewal journey that we're on. We, we want to call people to repentance, to, to faith in Jesus Christ, but we also want to call those who already know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. We want to call them to be engaged in the work that God is calling us to as a church. That, that we want to discover together how it is that God wants to use us in this community to be people who bless our neighbors, to be people who who live our faith in a tangible way in our workplaces and in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in in all the other places that we're called to. We want to be people that God expresses his love to, that we want to be people like Peter and John who through whom the power of the Holy Spirit works to heal, to bring healing to a broken world, to bring healing and faith to people who need it so much. If if we want that strength and power to be at work in us, we're called to look to Jesus. In verse 20, So that God might send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. That as we look to Jesus, whether it be initially that first time when we come to faith, when we say, yes, Lord, I am a sinful, broken person, and I need forgiveness and grace. Or whether it be at some point along that journey of faith, where we we say to God, God, use me, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use me in a new way. Use me to be somebody through whom you bring good news to this world. Let me embody the gospel. Folks, the the gospel is, is simple. It's the good news that Christ lived and died and rose again to redeem all those whom God has called. But it doesn't stop there. It's also the gospel. It's also the good news, the additional good news, that through that life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he not only redeems individual people, but he is at work restoring all creation. Paul, later on in in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians reflects on that reality. In, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, We are being renewed day by day. We are being renewed day by day. We are being renewed day by day. This, this journey of, of church renewal is a journey of re- being renewed day by day being renewed in faith, being renewed and reminded of that gift that we've received from God, that forgiveness and salvation, but also renewed to serve God and to serve others. 
It's what this renewal experience is all about. You see, renewal is about changing our hearts to see and desire and and, and to, to work toward God's future for our church and to join in God's redeeming work in this community and in the world. Those words challenge us. Those words from Acts chapter 3. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come. Let's begin this new year by repenting, turning to God. Whether it be for the initial grace of forgiveness and salvation in Jesus Christ, or whether we repent and and turn to God and experience that refreshment and renewal and see how it is that God works that miracle of refreshment and renewal through us in some corner of the world that he's called us to. We're called, just as Peter and John were, as apostles, announcers, proclaimers of that good news. To live that good news and to share it with those around us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this message of repentance, a message of healing of one who is so much in need, who couldn't walk who is dependent on the the kindness and mercy of others. And his situation reminds us that we are all dependent on your kindness and mercy to us. When we had turned away from you, you showed your kindness and mercy in Jesus Christ. That he lived and died and rose again to redeem us and all those you are calling and to restore all that you've created. Lord, we thank you for that good news, that gospel. And we thank you that you call us to participate in sharing that good news and in living it. Help us to do that as we go into this new week. Help us to live that good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.